Hello, this is Chris Lee of Southeastern 14 here to do SEC baseball power rankings as we enter week 12. That's right, three weekends left to go in SEC play. Lots of teams with things to play for, national seeds, potential hosting spots, just getting to Hoover, getting in the NCAA tournament. Just about everybody left has got something to play for. We'll get to that in just a moment. A reminder, first of all, we are presented by Bet Online, your number one source for summer sports this season from MLB, golf, NBA, and NHL playoffs. All the latest stats, news, and scores available to follow your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. Head to the website today. Use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Well, we start power rankings at the bottom where Missouri, again, has got our number 14 spot. The Tigers were swept at Tennessee, but, you know, I wish you could do something like a Bart Torvik for baseball and just see what it would say about Missouri the last 15 or 20 games because they keep saying it over and over. This is a good team lately. Not a great team, but a team that's been scrappily competitive. The pitching has gotten better. Look, I know you don't get points for getting swept, but Knoxville is a place that spits teams out, chews them up, and, and leaves them on the, the roadside for dead. And Missouri lost two one-run games after getting blown out in game one. Two to three, two games, that's really hard to do with that Tennessee lineup. And they did it without their best pitcher, Javin Pimentel, who was out this weekend. So, again, keep an eye on Missouri. Uh, the 14th team, but I, I think that's more of a reflection on the league than it is on the Missouri Tigers. All right, an, another Tigers at 13, that's Auburn. Uh, the Auburn Tigers took a game from the LSU Tigers after losing the first two. The bullpen was actually pretty good in that one. Again, I maintain the, the biggest problem with Auburn, it's not that it's a bad team. You look at the, the computer rankings – you see Auburn top 50, top 60, a, a lot of the ones I like. KPI's got them 58. Um, Kenneth Massey's got them 44. Not a bad team, but somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose. Auburn has played maybe the most brutal schedule in the history of the SEC to date and has paid the price for it. We'll see if the Tigers can get some late season magic and get to Hoover, but I, I think the odds are probably against it given that Auburn's won three games as we head into the eighth weekend of conference play. Next up, Ole Miss at 12. I don't know what else to say about Ole Miss. Um, decent offense, quality offense, but the, the pitching and the defense have just been atrocious. Ole Miss is just not getting consistent pitching from much of anywhere from any length of time. Rebels lost two of three at home to Alabama this weekend. They are our number 12 team and have won seven games. So Ole Miss actually probably got a jump on the other teams in terms of getting to Hoover. So keep an eye on that. And also a team that, despite the the ugliness of the pitching, I, I think is in the 20s in the RPI today, maybe the low 20s. So Ole Miss has got a chance with a miraculous finish to still get into the NCAA tournament, just given where that RPI is. All right, we get to number 11. That's the Florida Gators. And I think Florida and the next team I'll get to, you could argue either way for these teams. But Florida has kind of sneakily come along with the pitching. Uh, big development this weekend. It was only three innings, but Pierce Coppa looked, looked really good in those three innings against Arkansas. He struck out six. Uh, you go down the lineup, they've got Fisher Jameson's been really a, a good guy for them, good fine right-hander, I think, in his second year. But he's been money out of the bullpen. Uh, they've got some other guys there. Cade Fisher's been up and down. Uh, Jack Caglione continues to give them mostly quality starts on Sunday. Brandon Neely was good again this week. We know about the offense. We know that Jack Caglione can really hit. Uh, we know they've got other guys, Colby Shelton, Tyler Shelnut, Ty Evans. But don't sleep on the Gators is the pitching is starting to come along just a little bit. Okay, I said the next two teams were interchangeable. Uh, that next up is LSU at 10. And the reason I went with LSU over Florida, and I think they're pretty close. Florida's got a better conference record. Uh, Florida's been a disaster in the midweek, as everybody knows. And I think that counts for something. But top-end starting pitching. Luke Holman has been probably a top-three starter 
in this league so far. He continues to be really, really, really good, if not great, on weekends. But LSU got a great start from Gage Jump, who I think struck out 14. Look, there are some pieces to work with in the bullpen. They have not pitched the way that I think a lot of people thought LSU was capable of pitching before the season. Uh, Thatcher Hurd, you, you never know where that's going to go, but he's talented. Nate akinhusen has been off, but maybe thrown a little better lately. Gavin Guidry's a talented kid. Uh, they've got kids like Sam Dutton, Will Helmers, who have pitched some innings in this league. I think there's enough, Griffin Herring being another one too, I think there's enough on this team uh, for LSU to sneak into a regional and maybe do some damage once it gets there. Uh, we know this is a team that, of course, went to Omaha and won the whole thing a year ago. Jared Jones continues to be great. He's got 19 home runs. Tommy White has really stepped it up. I think he hit four home runs last week. LSU, its final three weekends, um, going to be Texas A&M, but that's in Baton Rouge, at Alabama, Ole Miss. Now, if they can get one of three against AM this weekend and take the next two series, I think LSU is probably going to maybe sneak into the NCAA tournament. We'll see where that goes. Uh, but in any case, keep an eye out for this team because I think LSU and Florida both are showing some signs of getting better. Next up, this is where things get confusing. I've got Alabama at number nine. Alabama's really hit the ball. Uh, of late, the, the pitching has been a little bit shaky, but um, Greg Frome been really good on Friday nights. He kind of has gone under the radar in this league. The Louisville transfer, the lefty, I feel like has been one of the probably the five most consistent starters in the league or, or somewhere on that short list. Ben Hess has not been good, but Zane Adams has been good. Their bullpen, shaky, but you look at the lineup. Um, I feel like Justin LeBron is really coming on. The, the star freshman shortstop, Matt Cassetti, is hit lately. Gage Miller has started to pick it up a little bit again after maybe a, a week or two in a little bit of a slump, or at least not the production that we had gotten used to seeing from him this year. Alabama at nine, but that's a really strong number nine. All right, Vanderbilt number eight. I, I could almost put Vanderbilt at nine. I think if Vanderbilt had won a one-run game on Sunday, I could have put Vanderbilt at five. That's how close these next few teams are. This, this is a team that's flawed compared to past Vanderbilt teams. It does not have the absolute shutdown Friday night guy. It's got a lot of really good arms. Most teams would play trade places with the pitching staff, but the lineup is just ordinary. Not a star in there anywhere, and the injuries are starting to pile up for this team now. You saw Ethan McElvain out this last weekend. J.D. Thompson was out with the suspension from that last game of the Florida series. Vanderbilt finally got Devin Futrell back. He'd missed some time with injury or, or tired arm or whatever it was. He was a preseason All-SEC guy, I believe. He came back, wasn't grading against Mississippi State. Jaden Davis, their second baseman, got hit in the face with a pitch. Uh, they're missing a couple other lineup guys. Chris Maldonado, their first baseman, out for the year. Look, I, I think everybody's got an injury or two, but they're really starting to pile up for Vanderbilt, and, and the Commodores lost a tough series, probably the most even series that was played this weekend. It was 15 runs, I think, for each team, and I don't know what the hits and the walks and all that were, but I think that was pretty even too. Uh, but somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose. Vanderbilt lost one at home to Mississippi State in a super-duper competitive series this last weekend, and that's why I've dropped Vanderbilt behind some of these other teams. That includes Georgia. Um, Georgia went to A&M and had a very interesting series. I think everybody's seen the bullpen incident on Twitter now. Uh, Georgia had a tough time holding down A&M's offense. Did get a win in game three, and that one is the pitching came through a little bit more. Um, I believe it was Jarvis Evans in that game, or, or maybe it's Colton Smith instead, excuse me. But, um, yeah, Georgia's bullpen this weekend, Brian Zayden has been pretty good for them, uh, but just didn't work out this weekend. He had his roughest out in the year. His ERA ballooned up. Uh, we know with Georgia what the deal is. It's that lineup. It's, it's Charlie Condon, who's got 29 home runs now. It's Corey Collins. It's Dylan Goldstein. Their, their pitching has been good enough in spots. Struggled this weekend against A&M. Um, Although, again, game game three, pretty good outcome, given who you're playing and where you're playing it. But uh, I've got Georgia at seven. Georgia has got some work to do because if it's sub-500 record in the league, it is 10 and 11. Again, played a, played a pretty tough schedule so far, 
it's got a chance to make up some ground and maybe work into the hosting mix this weekend. I believe the RPI is nine or 10. If it can take two or three from Vanderbilt this weekend, that series will be in Athens. All right, number six, South Carolina. And I could put South Carolina ahead of this next team. I, I think these are the spots, really, Mississippi State and South Carolina, and spoiler alert, State is five, are are interchangeable. The computers like Carolina a little bit better. I like Mississippi State's pitching consistency a little bit better. Uh, Gerangelo St. Joe was tremendous uh, to start game three before he wore down a little bit late in that one because State's bullpen's a little shaky, and I think they maybe had to hold on and ride that out a little bit longer than you would have liked to if your bullpen was better. Now, not the State doesn't have arms. It's got Nolan Stevens. It's got Tyler Davis. It's got Cam Schulke. Uh, but with Nate Dom out right now, I think you got guys on a little bit shorter leash. But uh, Cal Stephan or Steven was pretty good this weekend, just out by Bryce Cunningham. And Brooks Auger in that middle role of the two spot. Did not expect to see him there. He's been a short relief guy. But he's a guy who keeps the ball in the park. And uh, he did that this weekend, gave them a really good start, and Mississippi State comes away with a, a really nice series win. They're five, South Carolina at six, and excuse me for skipping around because, again, I think these teams are kind of interchangeable. Uh, speaking of good pitching weekends, Dylan Eskew, one of the surprise great starts of the weekend. Uh, South Carolina shuts out Kentucky one day after giving up 15 runs. Um, let that be a lesson to you baseball is a single outcome event. Uh, a lot of times what happened before, throw that out the window, forget about it. Uh, if the next day's pitcher's pretty good, uh, then it's a different ball game. That was the case for South Carolina. Um, again, this team, I've said, I think if it starts to hit the way it did last year before all the injuries settled in, then you're going to see a team that, that's going to elevate its level of play. Uh, and they've got hitters. They've got Petrie. Gavin Cassis hit a big home run this weekend. Cole Messina has been consistent. Kennedy Jones has been good. Uh, Blake Jackson has been good at, at times. Um, this is the team I, I think that can really get some stuff done down the stretch if the pitching's good. Like that bullpen, it's not elite, but it's pretty good. You trade it for most bullpens in the league. And if Eli Jones continues to give them quality work in the two spot, that doesn't always happen. But he's he's done that. He's been a pretty consistent guy for them for the most part. Look out for this team. I think Carolina now squarely in the hosting mix at 11 and 10 in the league. It's got Missouri, Georgia, and at Tennessee to close. So watch out. If, if the Gamecocks can get to 16 and 14, which would require them going five and four over the last three weekends, I think Carolina with that RPI is going to deserve a hosting spot. Uh, but you really need to take care of at Missouri this weekend and get two or three there if you are South Carolina. Next up, number four, Kentucky. And this was a team that, look, I, I'm not knocking Kentucky at all, but you wondered, can this team continue to play almost perfect baseball week in and week out? Uh, the, the answer has been no. Uh, Tennessee, I'm not going to say exposed Kentucky last weekend, but Kentucky's pitching has not gotten hit like it got hit by the Vols all year. And that carried over into the weekend at South Carolina. You saw Kentucky get that one wild win, but it gave up 13 runs in that game. Bullpen blew it late with three home runs in the night. I still think this is a really good team. All the computers have got Kentucky as a top five team. I'm not saying I'm selling the Cats. No, I think that team is a national seed caliber team and deservingly so. But I don't think Kentucky could continue to play it at the level it was playing at that long because who can? I mean, if they were going to set an SEC record for regular season wins, what they were doing going into the Tennessee series. It's come back down to earth a little bit, uh, but, but even with that, Kentucky has banked so much work. Uh, this team is 33-9 and nine on the year, 16-5 and five in the league. It's outscored teams in conference play by, what, 71 runs? Uh, Kentucky has banked so much stuff that it's just going to have to have a complete collapse down the stretch. Uh, big weekend against Arkansas. Don't get swept there. Then at Florida and then Vanderbilt to close the year. That's the toughest part of Kentucky's schedule. We'll see how the Cats handle it. But really, look, just two or three more wins in the league, and Kentucky's going to be hosting at a minimum, 
and probably a national seed with that RPI. So, so long as Kentucky does not collapse, it has put itself in outstanding space for the postseason, despite the fact the last few weeks have not been what the Cats wanted. Uh, this is still a really good ball team. I, I think every team has its rough patches in the season. That was just Kentucky's. That does not reflect how I feel about the Cats on the whole. But um, this league is a brutal league, as everybody knows, and you saw that get the best of the Cats the last couple of weekends. All right, moving on to number three, Tennessee. I could probably justify moving the Vols up to two. I, I tend to, when I do these, lean first on starting pitching um, is sort of a tiebreaker and, and bullpens too, just pitching as the whole. I like Arkansas is better than probably anybody's in the country. That is no secret. But for the Vols, um, kind of a bipolar offense this weekend. Six home runs in that game one and then six runs total in the last two games, including no home runs. Uh, but the pitching did carry Tennessee. Uh, the bullpen has been a little bit underrated. Tennessee's offense is always the thing that gets attention with this team. But Kirby Connell, the, the lefty who's been there since, I think, 1998, uh, has been kind of their closer lately. Uh, he's a guy that, that throws strikes and has been a guy that they have really leaned on late for bulk relief outings and also for closing. Nate Sneed, the Wichita State transfer, has been pretty good. Uh, they've got some other guys, Aaron Combs in that mix, um, Andrew Binky, some guys like that. They've got a bullpen of of good and quality arms. I think Xander Seacrest was fair this week, and Drew Beam was probably the headliner. Had a really good start. I think went seven, seven and a third, something like that, just being what Drew Beam has always been for Tennessee, which is a guy who does not issue free passes and keeps the ball on the ground. Uh, this is a really good team. Could argue moving the Vols up to number three, but I did not. Arkansas, too, talked about the pitching staff. Uh, the, the lineup continues to just be be good enough. It's not a bad lineup. When, when you compare it to the pitching, I, I think it gets attention because that pitching staff is so elite. But, again, you you got talented guys in here. Ben McLaughlin, Peyton Stovall, Jared Sprague lot is healthy again. Aloy, their shortstop, have been pretty good. Um They've got some depth off the bench. You, you're seeing them mix, mix and match with the lineup. Would you like to see more offense out of this team? Yes. 109 runs in SEC play uh, puts them probably middle of the pack, lower middle of the pack in terms of offense. Uh, but when you've given up 75 runs in SEC play, uh, that's just incredible. That's, that's just about impossible to do this day and age. Again, I always lean pitching if we got a close call. So I went with Arkansas over Tennessee in the two spot. But if you want to reverse that and tell me I'm wrong, go right ahead. I'm not going to tell you with absolute certainty that you are wrong. All right, the number one team, once again, and I didn't waver on this one, Texas A&M. Again, I think this is the most complete team in the league. Um, where A&M's weakness is, and boy, you have to really, really look to, to get one. Uh, probably starting pitching. Tanner Jones got just bombed this weekend. Uh, ERA ballooned up to 675. He's been really good in, in certain starts, but he got rocked for eight or nine runs this weekend. I believe it was nine in that first inning of that crazy game too, which is one of the crazier games of the college baseball weekend. If you didn't see it, Anum fell behind nine nothing before it came to the plate and ended up run ruling Georgia. That that's how good this offense is. And we we have talked about the, the top three, Grahovic. Um, we've talked about Lavalette Montgomery. I've said that threesome may be the best in the country. Uh, Ted Burton hit four home runs the first two games this weekend. The Michigan transfers really really come on. Jackson Appel, their catcher. I, I'm, I'm guessing if we did. All SEC voting today, he'd be your first team All SEC catcher. So that's five really big guns at the top of that order. Caden Sorrell has really come on the freshman, and, and here's one to watch: Travis Chestnut played second base this weekend. Um, Ryan Targotch just hasn't hit the last two years after that monster year in 2022. Don't know what happened with Caden Ken. He didn't play this weekend. But Travis Chestnut, seeing this kid play a little bit the last couple of weekends, he has been on fire lately. You put him in there, I don't see an easy out in this lineup because Hayden Schott's really good as their DH. Um, Ali Camarillo is, is probably more known as a defender, but the bat's been really solid on base percentage, well over 400. 
I mean, th- th- there's not an easy out in this lineup. Now, their weakness, uh, back to pitching. Jones wasn't good. Lampkin's been under a little bit of cris- criticism. He's not been as good lately. Ryan Prager, their number one, has been fantastic all season long. But uh, w- when you've got guys, you've got Ashenbeck. And Shane Sadeo, two lefties who can really give you a lot of innings in relief. You've got Brad Rudis sitting out there with an ERA of a buck seventy-one. Um, you got some other lower-level guys in that bullpen. ERA is under three. Isaac Morton, Josh Stewart. I think this bullpen. Um, I'm not going to say it's better than Arkansas's, but that that would be an interesting discussion if I put these two teams side by side. Anyway, AM's weakness at this point in time is probably those two and three spots in their rotation. I'm not saying they're even worse than most teams. You've seen a lot of teams struggle to find guys in the two and three holes, and even some teams struggling to find holes at the one. But if you're looking for something that's starting to get exposed just a little bit, uh, keep an eye on those two and three pitching spots. Again, I think that can be buffeted by the fact that you got so many guys in that bullpen. Brock Peary, another one of them, right-handed transfer from Arizona State, who, who can fill in and give you multiple innings when your starter gets knocked out in the second and third inning, and, and, and that offense can can keep pace <laughs> even when that happens. Um, this might have been the easiest choice in the power rankings is, is having AM at one. You, you could argue Tennessee. You could argue Arkansas, but you you look at completeness. Offense, defense, pitching, pitching depth, lineup depth. Nobody checks all the boxes like the Aggies do. Uh, They have been invincible at home pretty much. Two losses. Did pick up one to Georgia this weekend. They got to go on the road next two weekends. Well, well, they've been pretty good, too. I think they're 7-4 and on the road. So keep an eye out for that. But Aggies still my number one team. I'd be a little surprised if they relinquish that spot between now and the end of the season. Having said that, Arkansas and AM to settle it all week 14. That's going to be a dandy. That's going to be in College Station. So that might be the way that we can flip these. Maybe Tennessee can, can get that top spot. That's a pretty balanced team, too. But been a fun year to cover the SEC, and the Aggies are our top team entering week 12. All right, I'm Chris Lee for Southeastern 14 presented by Bet Online. Thank you for watching SEC Power Rankings.